Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Permanente Docs chat. I am your host, as always, Alex McDonald. Uh, I practice family and sports medicine here in Fontana, California, as part of the Southern California Permanente Medical Group. So today's chat, we actually have a returning guest. Uh, Dr. Sandy Irwin is the physician lead of the National Product Council, uh, and we're going to be talking about all things National Product Council. I bet most of you don't even know what that is. Uh, so, Dr. Irwin, welcome, welcome back to the to the to the podcast. I appreciate you returning. Thank you. It's really good to be here, Alex. I appreciate it. And please um, call me Sandy. All right, we'll we'll do. Um, so if you guys are joining us live, uh, please put your questions in the Q and A box. Um, we'll get to these as many as we can, but these chats are are short and high yield, so make sure you get those questions in early. Um, so, uh, Sandy, start by telling us uh, who, who you are and what you do. So I'm a I'm a head and neck surgeon by trade, and I'm based with the Northwest Permanente Medical Group. Um, I still, despite the fact that I am the chair and lead of the National Product Council, I am still um, a, an active clinician. I still have a portion of my FD, FTE that's in active clinical care, so I'm still operating. I'm still seeing patients, still taking call. Excellent, um, but I. Uh, you know, I got involved with the National Product Council quite some time ago. Okay, great. And you forgot to mention that you went to the best medical school ever. So shout out to University of Vermont. So not Yay, that not yeah. that we're biased or anything like that. So. Nope, nope. <laughs> yeah. Well, so let's let's take a step back here. Um, now, before I did my prep for this this podcast or in, in our prior uh, discussion a couple of years ago, I didn't even know what the National Product Council was. So, so, so tell us, you, you know, what what is the National Product Council and why should physicians care about it? Yeah. So, the National Product Council is uh, it's an entity that is sponsored by the Permanent Day Federation. And it is a collaboration between, a structured collaboration between clinicians mm -hmm. and our supply chain service partners to ensure clinical oversight and quality and value of the products that we use in patient care. So the National Product Council within Kaiser Permanente is pretty unique um, across the United States and the structure that we have because it is such a robust and well-supported structure, because it is physician-led, mm -hmm. and because due to that clinical partnership between the clinicians and our supply chain partners, we have the ability to establish and maintain standards and provide clinical driven, clinically de driven decision support for the choice of products that we use in patient care. Um, and when I say physician-led, I think it's really important to understand the, the, the gravity of that because we have a structure that includes over 500 physicians um, and non-physician healthcare clinicians who are accepted and empowered um, to be the voice of their constituents who are our colleagues. Um, and that gives us the ability to really provide um, backing and support for the value-based use of the products that we, that we provide. I mean, I think that's such a great example of something that happens sort of seamlessly in the background that many of us don't even know what happens and, and how this even works. I mean, I'll give my own example right now. Um, I, I, I perform vasectomies uh, here in my in my clinic, along with a couple other clinicians, and we are working on kind of improving our, our practice. And by doing so, we need some uh, different instruments or a few, a few new tools for this procedure. Um, and I've actually reached out to materials management, and they've worked very closely to try to make sure we, we get the right tools to do this procedure, you know, in a, in a safe, uh, evidence-based way to make sure we take better care of our patients. Um, is that mm -hmm. is that a great example of kind of how, why this matters? Yeah, I mean, pretty much, I think you can think of it in broad terms of anything that touches our patients or anything that you, that touches you and is something you encounter in your daily delivery of patient care, whether it is those instruments in your vasectomy tray, whether it is the handheld otoscope that you use in your primary care clinic, whether it's the exam chair in your primary clinic. If you walk into that room and you look around, everything in there 
had some sort of oversight by a team on the National Product Council to make sure that it was appropriate. Now, chairs, clinic chairs, exam chairs, they're not sexy, right? <laughs> surgical tools. I'm a surgeon. I think surgical tools are quite sexy. Yep. But, you know, it's important if you have an exam chair that doesn't accommodate the size of your patient or can't, you know, can't accommodate a person who needs a transfer from a wheelchair. That becomes a big problem. So even the even the sort of pedestrian things that we use in patient care are important. Yeah, I, th I think, and that makes such a big difference on sort of, you know, when things are working properly, no one notices, but when there's a problem, it's like, oh yeah, this this wheelchair, this, uh, excuse me, this exam chair doesn't work for X, Y, and Z it becomes a, a huge issue for right. not only physicians, but also for patients. Um, right. So I think that's a really good example. T tell me more about how you how you kind of became interested or, or, or aware of the National Product Council and how you kind of developed this, this leadership role. Yeah, so my journey with the National Product Council started back in 2006. I had been with Permanente for a few years and the head and neck surgery sourcing team under the National Product Council was looking for a rhinologist from the Northwest who would come down to Southern California and meet with some vendors and look at some stuff. And they were just looking for somebody who was interested. And I'm a scientist searching. I really care a lot about image guidance, which was the product they were looking at. And I said, heck yes, I would love to have some say in this. So I went and I gave my input and they picked the right system in my humble opinion. Um, but through that process, I actually ended up becoming a permanent member of that head and neck team. And over the next almost two decades, I've had the privilege of, of moving up through some of the different layers of the National Product Council to where I am now as the chair. That's, that's awesome. I, I think it's so interesting. It's just an example of we sort of, as physicians, we're sometimes trained to do this one thing, uh, but then within Permanente, there's so many other ways you can kind of get involved and do unique and different aspects of, of leadership and healthcare delivery, which you didn't even know possible, all while staying within within the, the, the KP family, so to speak, which I think is, I think it's kind of unique. Yeah. Um, so that's a great example. I, I guess, you know, why, I mean, we, you kind of touched on this a little bit also, but, but how is the again, physician-led National Product Council kind of unique to Permanente uh, compared to the way it's done in different uh, other, other different systems? So um, I think probably the, the most unique part of it is that it is an intentional and structured process that it proactively engages clinicians in decision making. And it's the largest structure of its kind in the United States. Like I said, it's we have, if you count everyone on the teams, including our sourcing experts, as well as our clinical experts, we have 80, about 80 subspecialty teams. Um, so we have a broad coverage of the different areas of expertise. And so you don't have, um, no offense, Alex, but you don't have a primary care doctor who is making decisions about my head and neck surgical instruments. You don't have a urologist making decisions about my, um, my radiologist uh, input on MRI scanners. So we have a, a broad breadth of subject matter expertise. We have over 700 team members and um, and that structure is formalized. It is supported by the enterprise. It's supported both by our PMG leadership across the enterprise and by our health plan um, partners. I don't think that that exists anywhere else. And it's important because not only are we involved in clinical quality, we are also involved in value-based sourcing value-based use. We want good quality, the right good quality stuff to provide patient care, but we also want to be good stewards of our patients' resources and we want to provide value. So we don't want to, you know, pay a lot of money for stuff that is not high quality. Or or um, that your physicians don't want or don't or that our physicians or, don't, or don't want. Yeah. Right. And I think that's really unique. And I, I have some colleagues who, you know, work outside uh, in a, sort of the fee-for-service world. And a lot of times they're told 
what instruments they can and can't use by usually someone who's not even a physician, um, yeah. let alone understanding how that how that product impacts patient care. Yeah, and that's the key is someone who's not even a physician, right? Mm -hmm. So let's, you know, let's be honest with each other within Kaiser Permanente, we also we provide a suite of materials for our physicians to use. And we do have some control over what's available and what's not available. But those decisions are not made by a clerk or a purchasing person who really doesn't understand what we're doing to provide patient care. It is made by by our colleagues, yeah. um, by the subject matter experts in our area. And I really feel like because of that, we have a lot of trust in the decisions that are made that we wouldn't otherwise have. I don't want to have, um, I don't want to be using an instrument that was chosen by one of my favorite people, my supply, my clinic supply chain guy, Mike, who I love and is amazing, but he doesn't know anything about what I do. Right. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So we have a question here in the chat, which I think is great. And and, and um, again, as a physician led organization, um, how if there's a change in product for for whatever reason, um, how are you sort of, you know, winning hearts and minds of physicians to get on board with that switch, uh, which might change their practice sometimes? Um, do you ever have yeah. kind of pushback? And how do you kind of help help them understand the bigger picture to, to really improve care and quality and, and service to our patients? Yeah, so we do that in a couple of ways. Um, number one, we recognize that it's not always the case that a single product is going to meet all of the needs for a specific scenario. So we don't always have a single standard. We sometimes have a dual, you know, double, two standards, yeah. dual standard, or sometimes as many as three products that all are you know, available for use for a specific thing. So we really work very hard to make sure that we are meeting the full spectrum of clinical needs around a specific product type. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we also, we recognize that sometimes we're wrong and we don't make the best choice. And, you know, we don't want to commit the hubris of thinking that once we've decided there's never going to be any new information that would, that would mean that we, you know, don't need to change something. So we have developed a formal process to support feedback. Um, we have an exception process. So if a clinician feels as though the current contracted product is not adequate to the task, they have a path to say, hey, I need something different. Here's why. And that goes to our sourcing team, our clinician sourcing team. And they consider that. They look at the evidence basis. And, and sometimes, not infrequently, we say, okay, yeah, actually, there's you need an exception for this device or this product. Sometimes they say, look, you know, we actually have looked at all of that. And we understand where you're coming from. But you can do that job with what we have. And so, but, but there is a pathway. There's not just a wall. OK, um, sometimes we have docs who are pretty darn adamant. And, you know, when you talk about resistance and my um, my approach to that is they're frontline physicians. We are frontline physicians and we can talk to each other and we embrace those clinicians and a lot. Of, we invite them to participate. That's the main way I think that you engage people who are skeptical or, you know, really questioning the process, invite them in. There are a lot of members of our teams now that started off as sort of dissatisfied end users. And some of them made their case and got the product, you know, got their exception approved. And some of them didn't, but still were willing and engaged and interested enough to say, okay, I want to be part of this process. And they, they're on the teams now. And so it really, you know, it's not perfect, um, but it, it really has been working well for us. I, I mean, you... I, I had a couple of questions and you basically just answered them already because that's kind of where we're going in terms of, you know, what happens if they, if they don't like that product is there a pathway, but I think having, having it be a peer to peer conversation, you know, yeah. uh, an oral laryngologist to an oral laryngologist, as opposed yeah. to, you know, a family medicine doctor to an oral laryngologist, I think having that, that area of expertise, which you shared and also the, the peer to peer um, really makes a huge difference. And 
you know, having everyone work together and collaborate, you know, creates a better end product. Yeah, you know, sometimes it's a little bit messier, it takes more time, but I think ultimately you have a better end product, you have a better quality care that you can provide for your patients. And, you know, right. encouraging behavior change is, um, you know, physicians tend to be set in their ways, let's be honest. Uh, but I think it's great that there's a process to to invite people in and, and engage, which is just amazing. And that's the best way to to really kind of make sure that that process continues to work and move forward. And so I, I love, um, I love that you're, you're doing all that. Um, are there, are there lessons here uh, regarding sort of the broader healthcare system and, and what, what you're doing on the national product council, you know, can we use that as a model for just, you know, saving resources and improving quality within the broader healthcare system? Yeah. So, so I think there, there are really three key concepts here that we are striving to do well. One is that idea of, of structured collaboration. Okay, so you, you have to have organizational support for the structure required to formally stand up these teams and resource them. You have to have collaboration between the clinical subject matter experts and the supply chain experts. Our teams are really tightly integrated. Um, and I mean, our, our sourcing partners are family to us and we can't do this without them. And frankly, they can't do it without us. It is a team sport all the way. The last thing I think is the concept of value-based use. I mentioned that earlier. You cannot drive value-based use, utilization. You can't influence that unless you have clinical champions. A clinician will not change their practice when they're asked to do so by someone who is not like them, who doesn't do what they do. You have to have clinical champions. And why is that important? Well, if you look at it from, let's say we've already established, we are all about quality and our stuff is quality stuff, okay? But the true, the true cost value is in the how you use the stuff, not in the price of the stuff, right? The best price is free but nothing is ever free. So no matter how good of a negotiator you are, and are, as my supply chain partners, no matter how good of a job they do, they are never gonna get to free. So you, there's only so far you can go on price. And the least expensive product is the one that you don't use, right? So this is where, you know, you heard me talk about the dual source, the multi-source, we do often have more than one vendor's product available for a given application. And the idea is that, I, I call this the 80-20 rule, right? About 80% of the things that you need to do with that tool, you can do with A. But about 20% of the things you need to do are more complicated, more difficult. There's something about it that is different. And for that, you need the special version, and that's B. And A might, might cost 1x, and B might cost 10x sometimes. And so when we put those dual contracts in place, we intend our users to use A 80% of the time, but and use B only 20% of the time. But they're both available. They're both on contract. They're both fair game for use. So how does your end user know which one should be used most of the time? Because if they don't know and they don't know the difference, then they'll just use B because B is shiny. It's like the Cadillac. Yeah. A is the Honda, right? So value-based use requires clinical champions. And you, can, you can't get to that goal of value-based use unless you are working as a team. So the clinicians provide the guidelines for the intended use of these contracts, okay? Not how you use the device to do that surgery or do that thing, but how we intend you to use these choices and why, okay? And so we, we call that decision support. The second thing is clear communication 
for, you know, have, have a clear communication process for how we get the message out, how we disseminate that. And we rely a lot on our, our health plan partners for doing that. It's also, you know, chief to chief, clinician to clinician communication. The next thing is data. So in order to really be able to drive this, you need to have analytics to mm -hmm. know, you know, where you're going with it. Um, and then you need to have an implementation structure at the local level which is what we call our, our local product councils. And that is a, that's a collaboration between clinicians and supply chain. Our, lo our local product councils are both, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so I like, to, I like to give the example, of, I have an olive oil example. Okay? okay, please. I like to cook and I have a bottle of Kirkland olive oil on my kitchen counter. I also have a very fancy clay decorative bottle of super expensive olive oil that I got from Italy. That Sounds fancy. Oh, it's very fancy. It's very <laughs> fancy. My husband has no idea the difference between these two olive oils. He thinks that I just put the Kirkland olive oil in the fancy bottle. And so the other day I caught him pouring like super like gold olive oil out of my fancy clay thing into a cast iron skillet to sear some, you know, like meat, <laughs> like, like smoke is everywhere. And I was like, that's my good olive oil. You're not supposed to use that. He's like, well, when do you use it? I'm like, you use it on fancy salads, right? Dipping for bread. 80-20. The workhorse yeah. for the skillet is the Kirkland. The 20% is my fancy Italian olive oil. That's that's a great example. That's a great example. Um, so we probably only have time for maybe one one more question here. We do like to try to keep these short and high yield, but I but I love that olive oil example. So are there are there other people involved in this? I mean, I'm thinking, you know, nursing or like yes. environmental services staff, or are there more than just physicians on this national product council? Yes, absolutely. So uh, you know, I mentioned those 500, you know, clinicians and other healthcare professionals. Mm -hmm. So I, I specifically didn't say doctors because right. we're not it's not all doctors we have nursing representation respiratory therapists we have um in our uh sterilization sst we have infectious disease folks we have environmental services folks um we have representatives from clinical technology um, so when we need to, because some of our equipment that we source is large and has a big footprint, when we need to, we engage national, national facility services people on our teams because we need to make sure that what we're sourcing is not too big to fit into the space that we have, right? There are a lot of details that go into this and a lot of subject matter expertise all around, not just the, the physicians yeah. um, and nurses. And well, and a great example that, that, you know, medicine is a team sport. And this is a, a great example of that, having all, yeah. all different perspectives and uh, yeah. area, area of, of expertise. Um, all right. This has been wonderful, Chad. I appreciate your time. My last question, we'll see if your answer changed from last time. Uh, what makes you most proud to be a Permanente physician? Um, you know, I, th I don't think this is a change. I can't remember what I said the last time, but we can check the, the video. <laughs> that, the thing that makes me the most proud is that I work with a group of people who all care about one thing. They all care about patient care and they care about being good stewards of their patient resource, their patients resources. Right. When every time I use something, I'm spending money and I'm not spending my money. I'm spending my patient's money. Mm. Um, and I think that at least everyone I work with on the NPC has that same mindset, but it's, I think it's pervasive throughout our organization. You know, it's, it's all patient focused. Perfect. Such a great way to end the chat. Well, Sandy, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your, your time, your expertise and, and, you know, pulling the, pulling the curtain back a little bit and explaining what, what this is, National Product Council is and why, why it's important for physicians and, and for patient care. Absolutely. It's my pleasure.